So my name is Quinn Morley. I'm the PI for the Vorbots Project. Uh, I'm a senior at Washington State University. Tom is my co-investigator. He graduated from WSU this spring. He'll be giving a brief presentation after mine. And he's on the call to take over for me if my internet cuts out or thing. It's kind of shaky. Elon hasn't saved me yet with Starlink, so we're just trying the best we can here. Uh, we're trying to unlock access to the subglacial environment under the SPLD. And the motivation here comes from the conclusions of Orose et al. 2018, mainly the existence of a subglacial lake under the ice sheet. And we're going to call this the wet hypothesis. And I will note that the wet hypothesis is still in dispute. It's very much an open question today. Uh, but also drilling through the ice sheet is one really great way to find out what the real story is. And so the first thing we did when we started this was to dive into the questions of the SPLD in an engineering context, and there's quite a few of them. Just an example, there's a lot of uncertainty in regard to the SPLD. Uh, for instance, the sublimation lag layer is very poorly constrained. It could be anywhere between five centimeters and 50 meters. That's three orders of magnitude. So as an inventor trying to make a robot that can drive up and down a hole in this stuff, it was frustrating and intimidating at first. Luckily, after diving in and talking to planetary scientists, we're pretty confident that we're going to see favorable conditions. Uh, the density is reasonably high. The lag layer appears to be on the thicker side. And ice this cold is very strong. Uh, and the dust mixed in, the admixed dust, makes it even stronger. Finally, we expect a thin layer of loose dust that's a few centimeters thick on the top when we touch down. This slide shows an ideal formation. Uh, we're going to use that as an upper bounds of our density. So this is the densest that an ice sheet could be, like if you made it in a laboratory. Uh, the plot helps make the next slide make more sense. That's why I'm showing it to you. The vertical lines show the density for various percentages of admixed dust. And the top hash area represents that uncertainty about the lag layer. So the first thing on this slide I want to show you is the blue line here. That's from empirical data on Earth from Lake Vostok in Antarctica. And that's the best analog we have for the SPLD. Uh, so the left shows a density versus depth with some positive annual snowfall, less than a few millimeters a year. And that represents the past histories of the ice sheet during growth periods. Now on the right, we see an older sheet with the top layers removed through a combination of wind, erosion, and sublimation. And that leaves a denser, harder ice. So currently, we think the SPLD is better represented by the plot on the right. And overall, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, I would like to say I'm not a planetary scientist. This is just sort of my take on what we're going to see in an engineering context when we touch down. So here's our potential landing site. The star represents the high reflectance area from Orose et al. 2018. Uh, the density overlay is from Lee et al. 2012 over a map of the South Polar region. The blue areas are closer to pure water ice, like we'd find on Earth in density. Uh, and the dark red areas have more admixed dust. And from this, the bulk density is about 1,200 kilograms per cubic meter where we're touching down. And that puts us in the greater than 10% dust region on the plots. So here's an analog ice score um, from Earth. And this sort of represents what we would expect to see on Mars in the SPLD, with the alternating layers of dirty and clean ice because it is a layered deposit. And this is actually dirtier than what we expect in the SPLD because we don't expect any rocks or big chunks. Uh, we are planning for rocks in our technology development, but we expect a very fine dust that was transported by the wind to be in there. Here's the close up of the Borbot drivetrain. And personally, I like the idea of two sets of tank tracks, but we still have some work to do to justify the number of tracks. On the left is a diagram of how the motion works. We can drive one gear or two gears, and the whole thing operates like a gear train. And the belts are actually flexible ring gears. This is an old prototype, but it's really good for the video because we can run it with a drill motor. And it's a resilient system due to the flexible components. So we think a small rock or a chunk of ice could get sucked through there and it wouldn't jam up or anything. We're also looking at flat belt versions of the drivetrain. Uh, using crown pulleys to center the belt on it. And it's, it requires some experimentation because the centering effect is a little bit different than with the herringbone gears. And we're not sure if it's better or worse yet, but we'll be looking at that pretty soon. So directional drilling is important for this type of work. And we think this configuration is one way that we can steer the drill. In case we want to make a branch borehole, um, so Tom will touch on this more in a general approach to directional drilling in a few minutes. 
But this concept uses two track pairs and two bore bots in our articulated joint. And a couple notes here, the tracks facing us are 100% in contact with the bore hole throughout the whole turning operation shown. And then there's another set of tracks here that temporarily lose contact with the borehole during the turn because of this excavated region. Now this strategy is how you would go around a stuck bore bot or otherwise blocked borehole. And that's one of the questions we get a lot. So instead of starting over from scratch, we can just start a branch at that depth. And then the other thing that's important is if we found a scientific finding in this particular depth, we could take another sample at the same depth using the branch borehole. Now, one of the things we're worried about is the layering of the SPLD causing the cores to fracture. And that's already a thing with small diameter cores. So we developed this positive core retention system that we can actuate from the bore bot. And we also think this would be handy for the lag layer where the composition is less certain. It's kind of hard to explain how this thing works, but the blue barrel, we locked the frame of the bore bot. And then we turn the red part of the drill with the drill motor, which uses the full drill motor torque for that. So we can crank down the iris. And we think if we put a ratchet in the back, we can do it one step at a time and slowly score the rock pour, tighten it up, score it again, and maybe even do a complete rock pour that way. We're playing on ice, but that's the example. So for sample caching, we want to use the adaptive caching assembly from Perseverance to cache our ice cores. So there's two ways we can do that. Either we can do recoring, where we extract the heart out of our 40 millimeter ice cores, or we could do subsampling, where we attach the chuck from Perseverance to the front of a bore bot and drive all the way down the hole and take a sample at the very bottom of the bore hole with the fresh ice. And there is another option where we could use a hot needle, sort of in the same subsampling configuration, to go into the ice core and extract hot gases, the evolved gases from that process and route them to in internal instruments in the rover. So for the rover-based instruments, we could use the URI instrument and put it in the MOXIE volume. It's much smaller than the MOXIE instrument on Perseverance, which was a technology demonstrator. So we're not gonna need to use it on any follow-on missions. And for more frequent analysis, we could put a Raman UV spectrometer on the rover deck. And then finally, we could put a mass spectrometer from the SAM instrument on Curiosity inside the MOXIE volume with URI. And that is a big challenge. We don't know if it'll fit or not, but the overall idea here is to use the URI instrument for life detection and physical analysis and get the sample context with the Raman UV spectrometer and log the entire climate record of the SPLD with the evolved gases and the mass spectrometer. Here we can see some options that would be deployed down the hole, like on the front of a bore bot. And Tom is gonna talk about instrumentation some more later. This instrument is called Watson. It's very cool. I recommend you check it out in the Eshelman et al. 2019 paper. I want to mention really quickly that blindly drilling into a subglacial lake with a battery powered robot is a difficult prospect. I think the safest and easiest approach is to drill a very small hole with some kind of tapered screw and leave that straw with a high pressure valve plugging the hole. The math shows that just four centimeters of ice is enough to keep the lake pressure at bay and the probe could be fitted with a water sampling device which can detach from the probe. It doesn't have to be telescoping, but I made the prototype work like that and it turned out pretty neat. This concept is basically just a sketch, but this is one way that we think a tapered screw may be able to act as a self-locking straw. The outside would need to be covered in some kind of abrasive and carbide cutters that have to be installed at the very tip. I really wanna take this opportunity and just thank the NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate and the NIAC program for giving us this opportunity to really dig into this. I wanna thank our amazing mentors as well. We could not do it without you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Tom now. I'm gonna leave this slide up for just a second until he gets the screen sharing set up. Hey, yeah, so uh, I'm Tom. Uh, I've been working mostly on uh, the mechanical engineering aspects of it and a few of the electrical parts of it too. And so these are just gonna cover a few of the engineering, you know, kind of, like broad topics that we've been working on here. Um, so, you know, big kind of components, uh, you know, what kind of computational, you know, environment we're going to be working with, uh, navigation, downhole, what sort of power we're going to need, and then along with the power, how are we going to keep the thing warm, uh, and then what kind of science instruments we're going to get, because that's sort of the, the big point of this whole exercise. 
So brains, uh, you know, the low end, one of the prototypes we're going to start working on in the not too distant future is just going to be using, uh, you know, a commercial microcontroller, think something like an Arduino. Uh, however, you know, using something a little more advanced like an STM32 or a TNT type micro microcontroller would be a little better just because it they have a lot better kind of built in peripherals and processing and things like that. So, you know, moderate speed and capacity, really easy to program. There's lots of open source libraries out there we can work with. Uh, you know, using an SD card for a prototype is, is certainly within the realm of possibility. And again, keeping costs low and, you know, very well understood technologies. And then if there is any kind of, you know, high end computation that needs to happen, something like an inertial measurement unit, something like, you know, UV spectrometry or, or any sort of, you know, fancier kind of sensors, we can farm that out uh, to distributed processors for that particular instrument. And that's, that's again, a fairly common op or, uh, uh, option. So on the high end, we can use something like a system on a chip, you know, cutting edge microcontroller, you know, plus an FPGA that we program with all custom, you know, software and, uh, and uh, capabilities. Um, you know, it's harder to program. Some of the FPGAs specifically actually generate proprietary software. So that, that would probably be something we wanted to avoid. Um, and then, you know, more robust memory and capability. Uh, you don't have to have as much distributed pro or processing in that case, uh, but it also pulls more power. And, you know, power is kind of one of the, the big limiting factors that we've been exploring during this whole feasibility study. So, you know, navigation, like Quinn talked about, there are a couple of different ways that we can go about, uh, you know, moving around underground. Um, we can use uh, commercial uh, sensor systems. So Bosch makes a really nice inertial measurement unit that's just all one chip. It's got, you know, filtering and processing built into the front, like built into the actual sensor suite. And then all you have to do is connect to it with a, you know, common communication protocol and get whatever information you need. Autonomous drilling is also actually understood pretty well. Um, the, what is it? It's the Enceladus Explorer program out of Germany. Uh, they have some really excellent papers. Uh, I recommend the one down at the bottom there. Uh, that talks about some of the algorithms and the tuning they've done uh, for their melt probe explorer. It's really, uh, really good stuff there. So uh, one of the other options here that, that I show in the pictures to the right are, are the, the possibility for doing directional drilling. So as you drill, just the process of drilling itself is going to cause you to drift off because of different densities, because of the rotation, the torque, uh, you know, what have you. So we need to be able to compensate for that. And using the treads, we can do that by having a variable pressure system. And so in this case, we use linear actuators to cause the treads to kick out. And that way we can apply a torque in different directions to the bore bot and get about a degree is what we're looking at currently. So that every little nibble that we take down the hole, we veer off about a degree and we can actually you know, make, some, make some pretty good transitions. Uh, to, you know, avoid objects, avoid a stuck bot, or again, like Quinn said, get extra sampling at a certain depth. And yep, just like I talked about there. So power requirements. This is, this is kind of the big, the big sticking point that we've been working on. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of cycles on these batteries. Uh, they need to be reliable. We can't have a cell blowing up while we're down a hole. Uh, that would be, that would be pretty catastrophic, for, likely. Um, which need to be, they, they need to have a very high energy density also. Conveniently, you know, lithium ion batteries are readily available. They're well understood. So we'll probably be looking at something like that for prototypes. In the picture, in the picture you see there, we're using 18650 cells. Uh, and then the black object is a uh, radioisotope heater unit that, you know, NASA makes. Uh, they put out about a watt and that would help keep our batteries warm. Um, additionally, we reduce the capacity of the batteries that we're using. So we take down the top and the bottom end so that we increase the cycle life. So we don't charge it up all the way and we don't discharge it. And that, that's another really important limitation on our power capability is because we are not using the full capability of the batteries. Uh, drive efficiency is a big deal. Like our, our minimum and maximum speeds are gonna have a really drastic impact on, on battery life and uh, you know, power efficiency overall. Like, are we gonna use a gear motor? Is it gonna have a worm gear so that we can have locking or is it gonna be a planetary gear so it's more efficient? Are we gonna use a continuous rotation servo motor? Like, you know, those things are all up in the air and we're still working on them. Uh, you know, hotel load. So just the processor running itself and normal everyday sensors, uh, those things are gonna be pulling power the entire time. So if we don't drive fast enough, then we, we basically get 
wasted power just because we're not we're, we're having these hotel loads that just kind of drain our energy continuously but if we drive too fast you know again efficiency may drop so again 18650 cells they're great uh lithium iron phosphates don't like going below zero degrees celsius uh, so we're going to have to find a way to manage that, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Lithium titanate, however, is really good. It handles cold temperatures very well. They also have really good cycle life. However, uh, 18650s are not a really common size for those, and the energy density is just nowhere near where it needs to be. So thermal requirements. Again, the, what we're looking at right now is the SPLD is going to be about, you know, negative 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty chilly. And since we're limited to about zero degrees Celsius for the batteries, we, we got to find a way to keep the thing warm. Um, because the atmosphere is so thin, we're not really that worried about convection currents. Uh, there will be a little bit of off-gassing while we're drilling, but again, pressure is very low. Radiation is going to be kind of the biggest loss. And then also, because we're down the hole there, conduction is going to be a risk that we need to address also. So there is going to be clearance in the annular space between the bore bot and the hole, but minor contact from steering and other kinds of things, you know, do provide the possibility of having significant losses through conduction. So how do we manage that? You know, possibly using electric heaters. We prefer not to because, again, power draw, uh, radio, uh, radio isotope heating units take up a lot of space, but they are effective. And then there is some waste heat from the components that we, that we hope currently our models are showing that it's about the same order of magnitude as our losses, um, but we're going to need to do further study on that. And then additionally, we can do structure design for warmth. So, you know, having a zigzag pattern structure increases the length and the thermal resistance of that structure. And also, you know, it provides a little springiness too if we need some sort of structural support. Um, and we're also looking at phase change materials. So zero degrees Celsius is conveniently the same temperature that water freezes at. And so we can, we can take advantage of that latent heat there and potentially you know, improve our margin uh, to those limits by, by having something that is kind of soaking up that energy. And that's, that's a, a, a pretty common method in a, in a few previous probes. So it's a well, well understood idea. So the instruments, the big reason we're gonna fly to Mars and uh, you know, sit around in the cold. Uh, so you know, again, uh, the discussion about power, low power, small size is really important. Uh, there's a lot of sensors out there that are that are MEMS sensors, so microelectromechanical systems. They're, you know, it's a it's a sensor on a chip. They're great. They got gas sensors, temperature sensors, all kinds of different things. Common, low cost, relatively accurate, wide variety. It's it's really great stuff. Um, if we have a you know navigation subsystem, for instance, that has a whole bunch of sensors built into it that we're using for navigation, but we can we can take that data and then use it to you know get pressure and magnetometry and you know, gravimetry also all free. So we don't have to have an extra sensor device on board necessarily for that information. Five minutes, Tom. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then, you know, these are just some other options here. So the energy we use for the drilling, um, sensing the gas coming off the uh, uh, drilling for the process there, seismic information, again, from accelerometers on the on board, tomography data, if the, uh, rover can make a wave we can pick that wave up and then interpret you know how that interacts with the ground um, and then resistance and then again uh honeybee robotics actually came up with a pretty cool microscopic imager on their drilling in instrumentation so uh, that's another thing that we're looking at as well and same thing spectrometry uh like quinn talked about there and that's it thank you so much for your time